Thank you for joining us today. My name is Laura Vandebuber from St. Joseph's Healthcare in London. Our presenter today is Kelly Willison. She's an occupational therapist with Kirkwood's Acquired Brain Injury Outreach Program. Today's presentation is entitled Brain Injury 101, and I'll hand it over to you, Kelly. Okay. All right, can everyone here at Parkwood hear me okay? All right, and hopefully everybody can hear us at the far sites. As Omar said, if you can't hear us at the far sites, you'll just have to turn the volume up and people who are watching from home, welcome. This is our first year doing it, uh, a webinar, so that people are able to view us from home. Um, so hopefully everything goes smoothly tonight. Um, we have the opportunity to use the webcam, but we've decided we're going to use that just for now so you can see who's speaking. Hi, everyone. Um, and then we're going to turn that off until we get to questions. Um, for those of you here at Parkwood and uh, watching at home and at the far sites, we're going to have you keep the questions until the end, and then we'll have a, a question period then. Uh, for people watching at home um, and at the far sites, you can type in any questions. Omer will be moderating. He'll be uh, taking care of that for me, and then be, they'll be forwarded on. So any that we receive uh, from here at Parkwood, I'll be sure to repeat them and so people can hear them at home. And any that we get from our far sites or from people watching at home, I'll read them out loud. Um, and folks here at Parkwood, you might actually be able to see them. We'll see how that all goes. So for now, I'm going to turn off the webcam. Um, so you're going to see the slides, and you should be able to hear my voice. All right. Okay, so welcome everybody. This is our 2017 uh, Survivor and Family Education Series. As Omar said earlier, um, I'm Kelly. Um, I work here at Parkwood in the Brain Injury Outreach Program. Um, this is one of the many brain injury programs here at Parkwood. There's also the Brain Injury Outpatient Program, our Neurotrauma Rehab Program, Omar's position. Uh, he is the Regional Coordinator of ABI Services. We also have the NRC. You will be hearing over the next few weeks um, from various members of our staff that we have asked or volunteered or voluntold um, to come and speak with you uh, in some areas in which they have some expertise um, to share with you. Those topics are all available on, if you guys receive the flyers, it's available at our website. Um, so if you need any of that information, we can give that to you after at the end of the session. So to get started tonight, we always start the series um, with Brain Injury 101. The topics that we're going to be looking at, this is actually spread out over two weeks because it's a lot of information. Um, so I'm going to be doing part one this week, and then next week it will be myself and uh, my colleague Jill Bowen who will be speaking. So when you see some of the agenda, don't be overwhelmed. It is a lot, but actually it's the agenda for this week and next week. Um, so we'll see where time takes us today, um, and we'll get started. We'll take a break around between 7 and 10 after 7, about a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back and finish off uh, the session, okay? So our agenda for this week and next week, uh, we're going to look at what is a brain injury and how is it caused? How does a brain injury affect uh, your daily life or that of your loved one, um, a friend, person that you know that has the brain injury? How does a brain injury affect the family? And what can you respect or what can you expect from recovery and rehabilitation? So like I said, this is the agenda for this week and next week. For the most part, this week we're going to be looking at the first two points. Um, and even then, we won't get quite all the way through the second point. Um, but we think we have a time to vote right, so fingers crossed. Um, so let's get started. So just some definitions um, for people who are just new to this. There's lots of acronyms in healthcare. Um, I do have clients who tell me that. I actually have a coworker, Scott, who when he first started with us, he said, oh, geez, you guys have a lot of short forms. There's a lot of ABCs and DEFs. So we'll go through some of those. So ABI is just the short form that we use for acquired brain injury, and that's just a brain injury that has happened or occurred after birth, okay? Um, traumatic brain injury is a subcategory of acquired brain injury, often used interchangeably. So you might hear some doctors use the term ABI, 
some may use TBI uh, in the States. A lot of literature still uses the term TBI, and that's a traumatic brain injury. And I'll describe those to you in a little bit more detail in a minute. Uh, Non-TBI, so non-traumatic brain injury. And again, I'll give you some examples of those. And kind of the big one um, that's been in the media a lot more, we're certainly doing a lot more work um, in this area, is with concussions. So that is a type of traumatic brain injury. And the preferred term for it now is MTBI. You can see the short form at the end there, mild traumatic brain injury. And that's so that um, it gets some recognition that a concussion actually is a brain injury. It's not just getting your bell rung, uh, get up and go. Um, it does, there doesn't have to be a loss of conscious, or consciousness with uh, a concussion, we now know. Um, and there will be some discussion, uh, further discussion about concussion. Dr. Heather McKenzie, who's one of our um, ABI physiatrists, so she's a specialist in um, medicine and physical rehab. That's what physiatry is. She's going to be speaking in a few weeks and talking a bit more about MTBI, concussion, and when some of those symptoms um, are and what some of the things she does with her patients are. So just to backtrack a little bit there, uh, traumatic brain injuries, it's exactly what the term means. There was some sort of trauma endured that ended up, the result of it was a brain injury. Oftentimes with a traumatic brain injury, it's not necessarily the only trauma that is sustained. There's often physical injuries that are involved with it as well. And by looking at the causes of traumatic brain injuries, you can see how that might happen. So motor vehicle collisions, car accidents, uh, slip and fall. You can see our little dude up here on, on the ladder taking a, a topple backwards, um, falls down the stairs. Um, we have clients that we see, elderly clients who have slipped um, and fallen downstairs in their bathrooms, younger kids who have been out um, maybe having a little bit to drink, had a little bit too much to drink, and well, end up falling down some stairs, slip and fall on sidewalks, fall backwards and hit their head. Um, assaults, so that can be something that you would typically think of, a fight, um, but also uh, domestic abuse is something that we also work with some clients who have um, experienced that and has resulted in a brain injury, oftentimes more than one, usually in the category of the MTBI or concussion. Sports injuries. Um, that's why you hear more about concussions right now is because of sports. Hockey, Sidney Crosby, as bad as it is, he's the best thing that's ever happened, really um, in the area of concussions has brought a lot of attention. Um, if anybody follows the news, uh, the National Football League is being looked at very closely right now for concussions. Looking at, it is getting looked at more closely now also in soccer. Um, and in a lot more of what we think of as professional sports. Clearly, boxing is an area um, that people often sustain multiple concussions, and I would say more of those moderate to severe injuries as well. Um, just one second, I'm going to take a quick break here. Okay. Yeah, we're just, that's just what we're doing. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so just, just let me know if you can't hear me and give Omer a minute while we figure them out. <laughs> Sorry, at the, at the, everybody watching home, we had to do some work on the lights. Um, so sports injuries, um, workplace injuries, so that can be, again, a slip and fall off of a ladder. It can also be if you're driving as part of your job. Um, multiple ways you can sustain injuries there. And the last one there is explosive blasts. So we, um, a couple of our programs here at Parkwood do deal with veterans um, returning, that are in the military returning from service overseas. Um, there's a lot of work being done in this area, the Department of Defense in the United States. Um, and we do tend to look to them for some of their research. Um, they do have some good studies and they are looking at a lot of um, the results of explosive blasts from um, 
um, IEDs and those sorts of things. Some of the non-traumatic causes that we uh, see are things that just happen kind of spontaneously. They can be due to different illnesses or poor health. So things like a stroke. Oftentimes people think of a stroke as being a more of a physical manifestation. People tend to think of strokes as blood weakness on one side or the other afterwards. Maybe have some memory difficulties, but sometimes the difficulties can be more um, profound. So stroke is definitely a type of brain injury. Um, we work a little bit with stroke in our brain injury uh, program, but we're very lucky here at Parkwood um, and in um, the great in Gray Bruce and here on Perth um, that we also have a community stroke rehabilitation team. So they do a lot of work with um, patients that have had strokes, um, whereas we would have done some of that work years ago. An aneurysm is a spontaneous bleed in the brain it's the result of just a weakened blood vessel. People are typically born with them and aren't aware that they have them. Anoxia is a lack of oxygen. The people that we see that have anoxia um, sometimes have had heart attacks where they've gone into cardiac arrest and have been without oxygen for a period of time. Um, also, people who have been um, near drowning victims, they might sustain some uh, anoxic injuries brain tumors, so anything that is in your brain that's not supposed to be there, that takes up space or puts pressure um, on the brain tissue causes damage, as does the surgery that is often performed on people when tumors are operable. So anytime an, uh, a neurosurgeon goes in and removes something from the brain, they end up having to take some of that healthy tissue, tissue as well. So you can, um, end up with uh, difficulties that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Infections, um, such as encephalitis, so that's inflammation or an infection in the vessels of the brain. Exposures to toxins, so something even like being exposed to um, certain types of smoke, chemical smoke um, on a workplace, a uh, work site, a house fire, things like that. Hematomas, or most often referred to as a brain bleed, or you might hear the term, a doctor might say a subdural hematoma, an epidural hematoma, usually re the result of some sort of um, trauma to the head. Usually um, it could be something if you've fallen and hit your head, it's like a bruise on the brain. Uh, and another type of non-traumatic injury is overdose. Um, and we do work with some people who have experienced overdoses. Sometimes that can also be in combination with an anoxic injury where there's a low um, amount of oxygen or a lack of oxygen. So just a little bit about some numbers. So what the literature tells us about brain injury is that one in every 26 Canadians will sustain a brain injury in their lifetime. So that's about, that's a pretty high number. Um, brain injury is the leading cause of death and disability worldwide. Um, because it often leads to other difficulties as well. And in Ontario, just Ontario itself, there's approximately 45,000 new cases in Ontario each year. So those are just some numbers for you to think about. So now we're going to kind of move into our the second point of our agenda. And this is going to be the biggest part of this week and next week. We're going to talk about some of the things that have changed. What changes after a brain injury? for the person who sustained the injury. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how it affects the family, and that will be next week. So some of the things that we hear our clients say to us when we're working with them um, is the things that they notice, and family members also report these things. So physical changes, things like headaches, dizziness, balance issues, feeling like you are going to fall or you do fall more often than you did before. Changes in vision and hearing, so whether it's sensitivity to light, blurry vision, um, with hearing, it can be um, everything is noisy, no matter where you are. Um, communication challenges, and for each of these, we're going to spend some time talking about it in a bit more detail. So communication challenges, just difficulty having a regular conversation. Um, a lot of people will say, with well, one person, it's, it's okay. If there's three people, like you add one more person to that conversation, it's just too much and I can't do it anymore. 
changes in sleep patterns, which is a big thing after brain injury, especially because, well, I'll talk about it briefly today. And then Laura, one of our physiotherapists, is going to go into it in more depth. Um, sleep is one of the most important things to get after brain injury. You want to have good sleep. It makes for a better recovery. A little different than related to sleep, it's feeling tired all the time. And we're going to look at this more from the aspect of cognitive fatigue or thinking fatigue or feeling overloaded or overwhelmed and just not able to, to cope as well. Changes in memory and concentration, those are two of the biggest things that I think family members expect when they hear that their loved one has had a brain injury. Um, but clearly you can see that's not the only thing. But we will spend some time talking about that. And those two things are very closely uh, interlinked. You have to have concentration in order to have a better memory. And concentration is one of the biggest things that's affected after a brain injury. Changes in your ability to manage yourself and your life. Very broad topic, and we'll break that down uh, a little bit more for you. Personality changes. This is something that oftentimes the person who sustained the brain injury doesn't necessarily notice this, but this is something that family members notice and really struggle with. Friends also really struggle with it. Um, so this is something we'll, we'll talk a little bit about too. Changes in your emotions and your ability to cope. Um, Jill, a social worker, she's going to talk to you guys about that in more depth next week. But certainly there is a change in um, your emotions themselves. People tell us that they feel them, they feel their emotions much more strongly and things happen a lot more quickly. They get angry a lot more quickly, frustrated a lot more quickly, they get happy a lot more quickly, like things bring them a bit more joy, a bit faster. Um, they cry more often. So what we often talk to people about is emotions are often at a heightened level for a person with a brain injury all the time. So it doesn't take much more to send them over the top and have it in a very strong response where they might not have had that before. And the ability to cope, we're going to talk a little bit more about anxiety and depression. Um, that often follow brain injury and also spend just a little bit of time talking as well about um, substance use after brain injury as some people do tend to um, either return to that if that's something that they did before or something that they turn to afterwards in order to cope. So just breaking things down a little further we're going to take a look at those physical changes. And hopefully I have these in the order that I put them down in when I, when I created the presentation. If not, just bear with me and we'll, we'll figure it out. With physical changes, one of the things that we hear a lot and ask a lot, so I'm going to say that there's probably some clients or patients here tonight and certainly watching from home. If you've met with myself, my colleague Jill, or any of our outpatient team, so Bob, uh, Shannon, Becky, Nicole, or Sandra, and have done a triage with us, you've all been asked to fill out a questionnaire. And these are things that we ask because we see these things reported to us all the time. People don't always know to pay attention to them, um, but it is something that we ask everybody that we meet. So with vision, one of the first things we ask and hear about is light sensitivity. Never bothered by light before, but now I can't go outside. Like the sun is so bright. Fluorescent lighting um, is very tough for people with brain injuries. And fluorescent lighting is everywhere. So even here in the auditorium, they did change some lighting. No longer fluorescent. They're LEDs, but it also changed the ability to dim the lighting. So it's not, we realize, we apologize, it's not ideal in here. We make the best possible efforts. Um, but certainly... The LEDs are a little bit better than the fluorescent lighting because fluorescent lighting has a flicker in it. And if you have a relatively healthy brain, your brain can tune that out. It's not distracted by it. But someone with a brain injury, the brain can't help but see it. And it, it just becomes very overwhelming and hard to cope with. The issue with that is there's fluorescent lighting everywhere. It's cheap. It's installed in grocery stores, schools, 
offices here at the hospital, banks, you name it, there's fluorescent lighting. The only place it probably isn't is your own home. Um, if you do happen to have it in your house, or if you're making an attempt to return to work, or you're a student trying to study, it's a good idea to get a desk lamp that has incandescent, just a regular old light bulb in it, um, and provide yourself some lighting that way. Some people um, experience blurry vision after a brain injury, double vision. I've had a couple people who've had triple vision where they see three things. Um, and visual processing changes. So that can be um, where your eyes are seen clearly. So if you go to an optometrist, they will say, you have 20-20 vision. I don't, I have contacts. So they tell me with your contacts, you have 20-20 vision. But what's happening is you're still not seeing things quite right. So we hear people report um, when they're walking, it may seem like the sidewalk is coming up towards them. We ask people when you're reading, does it look like the words are moving on the page or off the page or do they jump? Um, those are some of the things we ask people about. And what's happening there, if they say yes, is very simply, uh, what's happening is what your eyes are seeing clearly, that information is going to your brain, to the vision centers in our brain, but the information gets jumbled up in the brain. It's not interpreting it properly because of the injury. Um, we'll talk about a few things that might help with that. And in our third week, Becky and Shannon are going to be discussing that a little bit further. Um, anybody who's been here at Parkwood, you'll recognize some of the strategies when we talk about them. Um, so the visual processing changes are, again, a lot of people say, well, if I just get glasses, it really isn't about how clearly you're seeing. Your eye itself is working well. It's the information is getting jumbled in the injured brain. Difficulties with hearing often present as noise sensitivity. So even in a, um, a slightly, um, not a completely quiet environment, most people are good where it's quiet. Usually at home when nobody else is home. It's great, awesome. You can close the office door. Nobody, you can't hear them. Nobody's coming in. There's no radios playing. There's no overhead announcements. But then you move into even somewhere quiet like a library, someone with a brain injury can find that very overwhelming. They hear everything. So they're hypersensitive to noise. They can hear everything because their brain is not able to figure out what's important to hear and not hear, and it can't tune out the distractions. So it wants to listen to everything and it gets flooded. There can be difficulty hearing, so there actually can be hearing loss. Um, and then there can be, we always ask people if they can, if they have any ringing, buzzing, or humming in their ears, which is a form of tinnitus. Um, that is common, especially after a concussion where someone's bumped their head. Um, that's quite common. Pain is another area that people report difficulties with. They are in more pain than they have been before. This can fall into the category of headaches. It can be neck pain shoulder pain, and for some of our clients, it can be back pain, and it can be overall body pain. Their joints hurt, their back hurts, um, and it's something that is uh, frequently um, reported. But like I said before, if you've sustained a traumatic injury, you've likely sustained some other physical injuries as well, but now you also have a brain injury. Your brain isn't working as well or as efficiently. It can't tune out some of those pain signals and override it and kind of push through like you did before, it feels everything. It's not very efficient. It's not working very well. So pain is more prominent. So people struggle with it a lot more than they might have before their injury. Headaches is something we always ask people about. It's kind of common. You've hit your head or you've sustained a brain injury. We kind of think that kind of goes along with it. I'm always surprised when my clients say, nope, don't have a headache. Doesn't happen very often, but some people uh, don't experience headaches. Often they do, we ask people to scale them for us out of 10, so we have an idea of where they're at, ask them what makes it worse and better so we can try to implement some strategies for them. And Dr. McKenzie will talk some more about that as well. And last year, we had Dr. Sequera, Keith Sequera, who's one of our doctors here, he spoke um, and specifically about headaches and managing headaches, so that's available um, on our recorded sessions. 
Some other things that are reported from a physical perspective, dizziness, changes in balance. So people report that they feel like they're gonna fall over more often or do experience falls. Um, weakness, so just there can be sometimes much like with, in a stroke, you can have weakness on one side of your body or the other, weakness in your upper, like in your upper extremity, so arms, hands, fingers don't work quite as well, not as well coordinated. Um, some people do uh, experience seizures after a brain injury, uh, and that's something that is looked at um, when people come into our inpatient unit here at Parkwood, which is a 10-bed unit. People are often looked at very closely for seizures. Some people are started on medication for seizures just in case. Um, but it is something that can happen um, after you've had a brain injury and if you do have seizures and they become well controlled, there is uh, the need to stay on medication. And then the last point here is fatigue and we're going to spend some time talking about that in a few minutes. So treatment for physical changes, some of them are pretty straightforward. So for the vision issues, uh, we always ask people to go and see their optometrist. The question is, when was the last time you saw the optometrist? Have you seen one since your injury? If the answer is no, we ask people to please see your optometrist. Again, just to make sure that the eyes are working okay, and if they are, then we know where to go from there. A neuro-optometrist is somebody who specializes in um, brain injury, and they are an eye doctor and optometrist as well. They look at that vision processing piece that I briefly touched on and that Shannon and Becky will talk about. Um, there might be a therapist that use binasal occlusion. So again, anyone who's been to Parkwood has likely had that tried out with them. Just a pair of your either your own glasses or sometimes we'll use um, just reading glasses and put it on or pop the lenses out to see if it helps with reading. I'm not going to go into a huge explanation of it. I just want you guys to be familiar with the term. And Shannon and Becky will talk about that a little bit more. Vision therapy, again, if there are issues with vision processing. Um, so again, the eyes are seeing OK, but the information is getting jumbled in the brain. We need to work on retraining your brain to interpret the information properly. So that's what vision therapy would be. Uh, our physiotherapists and occupational therapists do some of that here at Parkwood. If you see a neuro-optometrist, they often have a vision uh, therapist that work with them, and you would go into their offices and they have um, programs that they put together. Sunglasses are also a favorite of ours. Again, because of the fluorescent light, um, it helps uh, eliminate that flicker. I recommend that my clients who have light sensitivity wear them all the time at first, um, especially anytime they're outside of their own home. I know some people will look at me and say, I don't know if I want to wear them in the store. And the response is just, well, give it a try. If it makes it easier, go for it. There's lots of people that wear sunglasses uh, in stores that don't have concussions. So my theory is if it works for you and makes your life easier, give it a go. For hearing issues, uh, we always ask people, have you seen an audiologist since your injury? If people are reporting changes in hearing, so hearing loss, um, if they have tinnitus, so the ringing, buzzing, or humming, audiologists, some audiologists are also very good at giving you some ideas around how to deal with noise sensitivity. Um, so looking at the possible use of earplugs when you should and shouldn't use them, there are definitely times when you should not be using them, and there are recommendations made around that. Um, Shannon and Becky are also going to talk about some tricks, and uh, they call them life hacks, um, in our third week, and they're going to talk a little bit about noise sensitivity. You may need a referral to, and I put this in here, an otolaryngologist. It's the technical term for ear, nose, and throat specialist. Because if you're an ear, nose, and throat specialist out there, they don't like being called that. <laughs> so if you hear somebody say, I'm going to refer you to an ENT, it's an ear, nose, and throat doctor, they may also say, when you get a call from the doctor's office, they may say, Dr. So-and-so, we're the otolaryngologist. So in case you hear it, um, it's just there for reference. No test on this. It's mostly a test to see if I can say it. For other physical issues, um, we strongly encourage people, if you have a family doctor, keep your family doctor in the loop. 
go to them. Um, if you need a referral, you can get referrals to specialists. One of the specialists they might refer to is a physiatrist. Those are our doctors here at Parkwood that specialize in brain injury. And again, their long term is they're a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Um, so Dr. McKenzie, Dr. Sequera, and Dr. Lowe are our three. Did I get all of them? Dr. Potter. That's all of them here at Parkwood. You may also need to be seen by a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, massage therapist. I'm not leaving out the speech therapist. It's just this is the physical changes. So um, some people might also um, want to see some people benefit from acupuncture or from seeing an osteopath. Um, chiropractors. It's really up to you, um, but those are some people that you can see with regards to some of the physical changes that follow a brain injury. Should I take a break? Keep going. You guys ready for a break? Okay, let's take a quick 10 minute break. So my clock says uh, five after. So if you can be back by quarter after and we will keep moving through. Thanks everybody.
Okay, everybody, um, we're going to get started again, continuing on with some of the uh, changes that people experience after a brain injury, looking at communication um, and information processing difficulties. So really what that is, is difficulty, it could be difficulty with reading, with writing, speaking, so conversations, staying on topic, finding words, um, and listening. So we're going to close down a little bit more and look at some um, strategies for those things. If I can get this to work. Hang on one second. Okay, there we go. So with reading, difficulty can be what I discussed earlier, said earlier about visual processing. So it could be if you're seeing, um, if you have blurry vision, you can't read very well because the words are blurred. That could be an issue. It could be, we do have people who report the words moving on the page or skipping, falling off the page. Some people report having difficulty reading to the end of the line. They get to the end of the line, but they can't find, they have a hard time getting back to the beginning of the next line, okay? So there's a few things that you can do for that. Um, the other thing that people report is related to memory, but they often bring it up when they at, when asked about reading is they have a hard time remembering what they've read or understanding what they've read. So in some cases, the tape on the glasses that I talked about briefly can help with that. And then we're going to talk about some other strategies that might help with that. So first and foremost, don't try to read when you're tired. You're going to see this repeated through a couple of these different areas. When you're tired, it's not the time to tackle something that is already difficult for you. It never works well for anyone, but especially after a brain injury. So just if you're tired, don't do it. Find something else to do. Relax on the couch. <laughs> Listen to some music. Um, if you have a hard time with reading, like I said, reading a line, coming back and finding the beginning of the next line, use a ruler or a blinder is just a fancy term, not all that fancy, for finding a piece of blank paper that you can slide down as you read. It blocks out the extra information below. It helps your brain and your eyes track the line. You drop it down a line and it's easier to come back to the beginning of that new line. If you are reading, stop for rest breaks. You're gonna hear this term, this statement, stop for rest breaks. Make sure you're scheduling rests all the way through this presentation and probably almost every week um, during these sessions. You want to schedule it ahead of time. When you're first trying to go back to reading, if it's something you haven't done in a while, you want to read for even five minutes, ten minutes, and take a break for five or ten minutes. And then come back to it so that you can see how tired it makes you. Are you remembering what you've read? So building in those breaks before you become too tired. If you're trying to remember what you're reading, especially if you're trying to study, write some keywords on the side of the page so you can come back to, I think I remember something about um, the King of England. So you could write that in the margin. And instead of looking through all those words on the page, you can see your own writing beside the paragraph and you can go into that paragraph and look for the information that you're looking for. Choose shorter books. So try at first when you're starting to return to reading, and I do this with clients a lot, I suggest reading a magazine article, reading in the newspaper, so some really short articles. Read it, see how you feel, are you tired, are you remembering what you've read. As that becomes easier, you can increase the amount that you're reading. Choose an easier read. Um, this is a great example. I didn't come up with this. One of my coworkers did. But read The Hunger Games versus reading a game, The Game of Thrones. So Hunger Games is a young adult book, so it's well written, but it's in bigger font. The books are maybe two inches thick. I don't know if anybody's seen The Game of Thrones books, but the paperbacks are probably five inches thick, and the font is teeny tiny. So just to give yourself a break. Take it a little easier, read something you enjoy, and make it something that it is a little less difficult when you're starting back. Read bigger text. So from the library, you can get large print books. 
or use a magnifier or try audiobooks. A lot of my clients like audiobooks. One of the reasons they do is you can slow down the rate of speech of the person reading it or you can speed it up depending on your comfort level. Um, there's a couple of, Becky actually put this together, and these are a couple of apps that you can get for your smartphones. Uh, you can get them on your computer and sign books out through the library online, or you can go into the library and they have audiobooks that you can sign out. Also, Costco has audiobooks, um, some of the newer ones out, so that's something to keep in mind. Strategies for writing. There it is again. Don't write when you're tired. It takes a lot of coordination. Writing is a lot of thinking, and then you have to hang on to the pen, and you have to focus on what you're writing, how well you're going to write it, what was I writing, and going back and thinking about that. It's, it's, there's a lot more to it than you think. And also, your handwriting and ability to write can change after a brain injury. So a lot of people report that. My writing doesn't look like it used to. So when we hear that, what we tend to do is try the tape on the glasses. And oftentimes it will help people. Not always, but sometimes it will. It just makes it a little bit easier. If you have to, I don't know why word processor is still in here. Use a computer. <laughs> um, use a laptop. Use a keyboard. Um, when you're using that sort of electronic device, you can use a spell checker or have a, uh, it will proofread, look at grammar, spelling errors, or have someone proofread it for you, especially if you're a student and you need to hand in an assignment, or it's at work and you need to hand, you have to give in a report to somebody, have somebody else take a quick look over it for you. You can dictate your work. Um, a lot of smartphones have the ability for you to record and um, go from um, voice to text is the, ch the term for it. So all it does is it listens to you and it puts it in, it just types it out for you and it puts it into a document that you can then print. Um, there's also um, Dragon, oh, what's it called, Dave? Dragon Dictate. And there's a couple of other ones. Speech, the speech therapists often use it. There's also some apps that you can get um, that will do that as well. Um, Word prediction software in those types of apps and programs, you have to do some training. The programs have to be accustomed to your voice, your inflection, so how you say words and pronounce them. Um, but after some training, they actually work quite well. Um, and the word prediction software, if people have smartphones, you know, when you're texting or typing, it autocorrects or it pops up some options at the top for you. Sometimes that's easier. You can actually turn that on in, I think Word has that ability. If you can't quite come up with the word as you start to type, it'll pop up four or five choices. You can tap on the word that you want and it puts it in. So there's that as well. Some strategies for speaking. Speak slowly with long pauses. This is for, for people who are having difficulty speaking. Don't rush, stay calm. Um, I actually just saw, I should have put it in here, when I was looking for some clip art for this presentation, there was one of the big red signs that said, keep calm and slow down. And I thought, oh, that might work, I should have, so I should have put that one in. But it, again, take your time, you may not find the exact word, talk around it, describe it, what does it do, what is it used for, what does it look like. And the person that you're having the conversation with can hopefully help you fill in the blanks. Share your difficulties so that other people understand. So if you say, you know, I've had a brain injury, I had a concussion, you don't even have to say why, just say, I'm having a hard time finding my words today, so please bear with me. And, and you know, again, it's getting your, your point across. And that way the person knows to give you some extra time to get out what you want to say. And oftentimes if you say that, the other person will also give you time. Once they've said something, they'll give you some extra time to think through what they've said. Try to stick to short sentences with familiar words. 
This isn't the time to do the uh, calendar or the roll of toilet paper. That's the word of the day. And you get a word like otolaryngologist. This isn't the time to start doing these things. Short sentences, familiar words, as brief as possible. As I said before, when you're stuck for a word, try to think of something that is similar to it. Again, talk around it, describe it. Try to plan what you're going to say in advance where possible. So in this series, this uh, survivor and family education series, we have survivors that come in and speak during the last week to survivors. And our therapists here, they volunteer to do this, the, the survivors do. They work with people that they've worked with that have helped them with therapy. They do a lot of prep. They do a lot of, this is what I'm going to say, and they stick to their script, and they do very, very well. So this is something to try to do, especially if you're going to the doctors um, and you know you have some specific questions, write them down, stick to your script. Try not to let, you know, don't get off track. It's very easy to do. Use gestures or pictures, some sort of nonverbal communication. A lot of hand talking goes on. Um, and really what's important is getting your message across, getting your point across. It's not necessarily having the words just exactly right. For listening, after a brain injury, sometimes people need more time to process and understand what has been said to them. So you can ask the person to speak more slowly, ask them to repeat what they've said. You can ask them to explain what they've said, or, and, and what you should do is the second point up here, repeat what the person has said to you or what you think they have said to make sure that you did hear it, hear what they said and that you're understanding what they're trying to say. It gives them the opportunity to say, no, no, that's not quite right, or to say, yeah, you got it. And then you can continue on in the conversation. Some strategies for family members and caregivers, friends, um, anybody who, who is around someone with a brain injury. When you are doing things to try to help them out, don't assume that they can read or write at the same level that they did before. Um, I had a client who was very well educated, a master's of education. Um, he wanted to return to work. He'd worked at a school, he was a, a principal, and he wanted to return to work even as a teacher. But when some testing was done, he tested at a grade three level for math and a grade four level for reading. So that was very telling for me because I sent him email summaries after we met I had to be very careful about the language that I was using when I sent him the summary. It's very easy to assume that people can read and write at the same level as they did before. So just be careful with that. Again, short, simple, brief, and familiar words. Slow down your delivery of information. So speak more slowly. That is a struggle for me. I admit it. <laughs> um, but try to slow down what you're saying doesn't always mean you have to increase the volume of your voice. Um, sometimes people think because you're speaking more slowly that you have to speak more loudly. And anybody who has noise sensitivity will go like this and shrink away from you. So you want to be careful about that. You uh, write down important information versus just telling somebody. So I have a lot of clients, their spouses will leave for the day, go to work. You know, I, I asked them to do like three or four things, just three or four things today. I came home and nothing was done. That's partially because they can't remember and they may not have understood it. So to-do lists are a beautiful thing. Written information is great. You can go back and look at it. Checklist, again, very brief, very simple language, but when it's done, you can check it off and it gives you a sense of accomplishment. When, this, when you're supposed, the spouse comes home, they can see that it's done, and it also gives the person something to refer back to, because we'll talk about this next week. They can lose track of where they are in the day, and they don't know what to do. So if it's not written down, and they don't have somewhere to go to, they can spend the whole day doing lots of things, but none of the things on the list, and that can cause some issues. Make sure you provide information in small chunks. Maybe in a conversation, it might just be one sentence at a time to ensure that it's being understood. Make sure you let the person know the person with the brain injury. If you don't understand them, 
ask them. They'll try to explain it to you. And it might be some of that word finding difficulty. So help them out and say, oh, is this what you're trying to say? Or again, give them the, the cue of, well, what does it do? Or what does it look like? Because sometimes talking around it, they need some help with that. Ask them to repeat what you have said. This is important. If it is important information, and you want to make sure that it has been remembered or might be remembered, ask them. I've had a couple of interesting situations where I've been working with clients. I finished my visit with them. I get home. I had a conversation with the client about license plates. He wanted to know how to go about renewing the sticker on his license plate. But the issue was he couldn't drive right now. He had a suspended license, medically suspended license. So we just talked through it and I said, well, you should check and see if you need to get them renewed because right now you're not driving, there's some insurance issues, you and your wife should look into this. Okay, I don't quite get the email summary sent out to this person and I get a phone call from his wife that says, are you crazy? You told him he could go back to driving? He can't drive. The doctor told him he can't drive. He absolutely can't drive. And I'm thinking, so not the conversation that we had today. I really should have asked about that. So again, there was some confusion that I didn't realize was going on. The license plate he equated to driving. Or when he tried to explain it to his wife, he maybe couldn't get the words out properly, saying we just talked about the insurance. It wasn't about driving. So always good, get somebody to repeat back what you have said to them, just to make sure that everybody has it right. When you are speaking with someone with a brain injury um, or trying to um, expect them, even with email, and you're trying to expect them to respond to you, decrease the distractions. So turn off the TV, turn off the radio, not just turn down, turn it off. Go to a quiet space. Um, if the kids are chattering in the background, then go to another room so that you can have a conversation. Your distractions more likely to hear, understand, and remember. Again, a brain that has an injury can't tune out distractions. It holds on to, to all kinds of information because it might be important. It doesn't have that ability to filter it out anymore. Switching gears a bit, sleep patterns. This is very important um, after brain injury. Good sleep, very important. It's one of the reasons we're going to spend part of another session talking about it. It's very important to the healing process along with nutrition and physical exercise. These are some things that are very important. The a lack of sleep can make life harder and it often makes brain injury symptoms worse or seem worse. So things like memory, attention, your ability to learn new things. Unfortunately, with brain injury, the brain injury often affects sleep patterns. You can have insomnia where people have a hard time falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, basically not getting enough sleep, hypersomnia, too much sleep. There can actually be a change in sleep patterns where people get their days and nights mixed up. So not very functional, especially if at some point you would like to return to school or return to work um, if you have your days and nights mixed up. We also have people, um, I always ask people now, when they wake up, do they feel rested? And a lot of people will answer, no, not really. And so we'll often recommend that they go for a sleep study to make sure that they don't have a form of apnea. You can look at the person and think, they don't look like they have apnea. So sleep apnea often presents as snoring. But what happens is people stop breathing in their sleep. So sometimes after brain injury, that trigger doesn't work the same way. Um, so I've had in the past mm, six months, I've had three clients that have actually gone for sleep studies. And it's been determined that they have sleep apnea. And a couple of them are um, on CPAP machines now and find that they're sleeping much better. So sleep is very, very important and is something that we will ask you about um, and that you should keep an eye on. So some of the things that you can do about sleep, these are just some sleep hygiene, is what is called sleep hygiene tips. And again, Laura's going to talk about this, so I'm um, not going to spend a ton of time here, but establish a bedtime routine. So literally start your brain getting ready for bed a couple of hours before that, whether it's um, you have a, a nighttime snack, 
an herbal tea, no caffeine people. Herbal tea, um, have a shower or a bath, get in your comfy clothes or PJs, read a little bit. If you watch a little bit of TV, like half an hour of TV, whatever that might be, if you stick to that routine, our brains love routine, and we're gonna talk more about that as we go through. But if you start doing that and do that over and over again, as soon as you start to make the herbal tea, it's the key to your brain. And it's saying, right, we're going to get ready for bed. I'm going to try to sleep in an hour and a half or two hours, whatever your routine takes. So try to establish that. And for each person, it's very unique, but these are just some ideas. Um, it's all about retraining your brain. Go to bed and get up at the same time every day. This is important for everybody, whether you have a brain injury or not, so much so that on... Um, our phones, on our smartphones now, um, iPhones at least, maybe I would imagine on Android, but iPhones now have a function on them that helps you establish a regular sleep-wake cycle. So it's, that, it's very important. You want to remove electronics from the bedroom, things like your iPhone. Um, if you have it in there for an alarm, that's okay. You can't be reading on it. Remove your iPads, tablets, laptops, out of the room for at least an hour before bed you want to be off of screens if you can help it there are some settings on the electronics where you can filter out the blue light there's night shift on the iPhones there are apps on the other phones that you can put on it gets rid of the blue light from the screen it's okay it's not ideal you still want to stay off the electronics they're stimulating bedroom is for sleep and intimacy only so no napping in there don't go in there and read during the day um, you just you don't want to you want to stay away from that as much as possible so that the bedroom is just for sleep exercise daily physical exercise is important but not close to bedtime at least I, I think it's about three hours before but Laura can tell you more about that you want to avoid caffeine or stimulants um, including alcohol and nicotine close to bedtime at least six hours before a lot of people think that alcohol helps them sleep it helps you fall asleep but it wakes you up later on. So you want to be careful with that. You want to avoid large, heavy meals and start limiting your fluid so that you're not up during the night going to the washroom a lot. This is very important. If you are unable to fall asleep within 15 to 20 minutes of going to bed, I don't care how comfortable the bed is, the blankets are so cozy and I'm warm and it's cold out there. Oh, no, I'm sure if I give myself five more minutes, it'll be fine. Get out of bed. It literally works because I'm one of those people that thinks, oh, no, the bed's really comfortable. It's going to be okay. And if I simply get up and get a drink of water or go to the washroom, I come back to bed, almost guaranteed I fall asleep quite quickly. So get out of bed. Even if it's just take a little stroll down the hall, back again, go to the washroom, even if you don't have to go, just a little break from the bed, get back in. Don't, no reading really, don't get on the computer, don't turn the TV on, just go back to bed. If you wake up again, you can repeat the same thing. I swear it works, not all the time, but for the most part it does. What can family members do to help with this? Help people enforce and use, encourage them to use those tips we've just talked about. Help for a spouse or a parent, try to align your sleep-wake schedule with the person with the brain injury. Promote a sleep-friendly environment. Cooler bedrooms are always good. Um, it's easier to fall asleep in an environment that's cooler. You can add blankets on, but if, if you have a cooler bedroom, it tends to help. Um, same as we say for people with the brain injury, avoid the caffeine and heavy meals before bed. If you do, they likely will as well. And change is often easier for people without a brain injury than those with a brain injury. None of us like change. But after brain injury, it's very difficult for the brain to make changes. So if you're modeling, if you're showing and doing and participating in the same changes, it's easier for the person with the brain injury. Feeling tired all the time. So this correlates, it, it is closely linked to sleep, but it has so many other um, things that contribute to it. And fatigue impacts everything that you do. So this is a rather overwhelming slide. It's kind of intended to be that way so that you understand there are a lot of things that can contribute to fatigue. So it can be what we just talked about, changes in sleep patterns or lack of sleep. 
spent too much time thinking right before bed, or you've been thinking a lot and it makes you tired. Medications can make you feel sleepy and drowsy and can make you feel more tired than you actually are. Energy levels. So after a brain injury, and we're gonna, you're going to hear me talk about this, Becky talk about this, your energy levels, if you think of it as a gas tank, you start at full at the beginning of the day if you've had a good night's sleep. If you haven't, you might be starting at three quarters of a tank. And depending on how you spend your energy during the day, there's one thing for sure I can tell you, your brain goes through that energy a lot faster than it did before. So you can go from full to empty, if you're not careful, before lunchtime. So we'll talk to you about this. Um, so energy levels contribute to fatigue. Your physical well-being, if you're in a lot of pain, if you experience pain and headaches, you're more tired. Brain, your brain is not as good at coping with pain, it makes it tired. Illness, something like a cold can knock people off for two or three days, whereas before they might have been, been able to kind of push through and keep going. It just totally takes the wind out of their sails and they can't keep going. Even just the healing of the brain itself, that is going on as well. That takes energy. So there, there's, we don't have an unending well of energy. None of us do. After a brain injury, that well is just not as deep. Not, we don't have as much energy in the gas tank. Levels of motivation can affect, your, can affect fatigue levels. Lack of confidence in yourself and your abilities can just make you feel like, what's the point? Or I'm too tired. I'm just too tired to do this today. Hunger um, can, you know, contribute to fatigue, stress, and high levels of uh, physical activity. So these are all things that can contribute to fatigue. It fluctuates over the day and over the week, literally from minute to minute and hour to hour. It's an ongoing symptom. And what this means, what I mean by this is, this is one of your longest lasting symptoms after a brain injury. Some other things, you're gonna see improvement in other symptoms. You are going to see an improvement in your fatigue levels and how long you can go and do things. But it is something that's going to be there for a really long time. If you use strategies well, some of the things we'll talk about, it makes it easier. And over time, fatigue does get less. But you still need to take it easy on yourself. You still need to make sure you're taking activity breaks before you get too tired. And you're going to need that to do that for a lot longer than you ever thought that you were going to. And believe me, if you do, you will thank yourself for it. Fatigue has an effect on other symptoms. I said this before, if you're tired, your other symptoms are going to seem worse. Headaches might seem worse, dizziness might seem worse, can't read as well. So don't do things when you're tired. Cognitive versus physical fatigue. Cognitive fatigue is brain fatigue. Your brain gets tired doing thinking. Guess what your brain does all the time? It thinks all the time. It's responsible for coordinating everything in your body. It never stops. It doesn't stop even when you're sleeping. It rests and recovers when you sleep, which is why sleep is so important, but it never stops going. So things like talking on the phone in a crowded environment while you're trying to speak and filter out other noises. What was the topic we were talking about? Who last spoke? Is it my turn to speak? Am I gonna be interrupting? All of those sorts of things, very overwhelming. Visually stimulating environments and activities. So this is Becky's terminology, I really like it. It's the evil triad. Things that are bright, colorful, and moving. So everything that you find at a Walmart, right? Worst environment for somebody with a brain injury. That is cognitively fatiguing. It makes you tired. It's not like running a marathon. It's a different tired, but it's a real tired. So don't try to, you know, push it up and say, oh, no, no, it's just, I'll be fine. It's real. You need to, you need to make sure you build in your brakes and take time um, away from it. Driving. Driving can be tiring even as a passenger because, again, if you're having some visual processing issues, you're sitting in a car as a passenger, your eyes are seeing things move, your body's giving your brain different feedback about, but I'm sitting still, but I'm seeing things move. So your brain has to work to figure that out. So even being a passenger can be tiring. I have clients who do drive, who don't drive when it rains because it's too tiring for them to, to 
filter through the raindrops or the windshield wipers make them sick. So they don't drive. They're not driving at this time. Oh, I didn't know Sonic moved. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> any activity that requires filtering. Um, so any noise in the background will be distracting and takes a lot of energy to put up that filter. Cognitive tasks, so increased attention and processing, reading, which I was doing, paying bills, doing homework, getting your kids organized to get out of the door in the morning, getting yourself organized to get out the door in the morning, any of those sorts of things. Physical activity, I'm going to switch the slide, sorry guys. Um, physical activity can be very hard on you. Things that were very easy and didn't take a lot of energy before are more tiring now. You know, the job that you used to take, number one, you can't tolerate it in the same way. Um, it's hard on your head. But when you do start to get back to it, you can't just jump back into it. So the physical fatigue of doing things, it's a little bit different after a brain injury. So your energy isn't limitless. Like I said, it's a gas tank. It can only get so full, and it can get empty really quickly. You need to pace yourself so that you don't run out of energy or run out of gas before the end of the trip. And I need to move that car. So sometimes you're going to find that you have too many activities in one day. If that's the case, if that happens a few times, it's okay. It's how you're going to figure things out. Look back and see if there's a pattern where you can group some activities together so that when you do leave the house, you do one or two things that day, and then you come home and you rest. The next day, you might go to a different part of the city and you group together errands that have to be done there taking a look at that. Doing too much, you, what you're going to find is you're going to be tired and your symptoms are going to be worse. You're going to be overwhelmed. You're going to have a headache. Um, you're going to feel some of those, those things that you've been feeling. So you may need to look at reprioritizing your activities. Becky's going to spend more time talking about this. And I know I'm coming up. We've decided the last 15 minutes for questions. I'm going to finish this part and then we'll do questions. Um, so pacing is what it sounds like. Pacing and planning is what we talk about. Um, it's not doing too many activities in one day or at one period of time. It's like budgeting money. I'm going to spend this amount of money here because they only have so much money. I don't have a money tree growing in my backyard. I don't have an energy tree growing in my backyard. If I had those things, whew, life would be grand. But you don't. We all have to work within limits. Your limits are smaller than they were before. You just don't have the same amount of energy. And again, you go back to it, your brain uses it a lot more quickly. It's not as efficient. It's not one of our fuel efficient cars. It is a gas guzzler. It is the biggest SUV you can think of. That's what it's acting like now because it's trying to do too many things at once while it's trying to heal. It's just not as good as it was before, not as efficient. You want to build rest breaks into your day. So we, we recommend starting with like 15 minutes per hour. Do something for 20 minutes, half an hour. Take the 15 minute break. Don't care how you're feeling. If you think you're feeling good, don't push through. You can't do that with a brain injury. You need to take it easy on yourself. This is unlike any other injury you've sustained before. Not like a physical injury where you kind of push the limits and see how far you can go. If you push limits with a brain injury, then you're going to crash. You're going to have symptoms. You're going to have two or three days where you feel like you can't get out of the house or off the couch. You want to alternate some activities. So thinking versus doing. So do some, if you have to pay bills, pay the bills. Do it for 15 minutes. Then go for a walk or do some dishes. Start the laundry. Something that's very different. You want to reduce activities that cause symptoms. So especially with brain injury, screen time is bad. It's not a great thing when you first have an injury. So limit the amount of TV you're watching, computer work that you do, time spent in busy environments. If you can find someone else to go do your grocery shopping, you should. <laughs> you want to avoid the grocery store. It's very, very busy. Don't go into a Walmart. Go somewhere else. I know that it's cheaper to get stuff there, but for your own health and for your own sanity, go somewhere else that's not quite as busy if you really need something. You can eventually put some good plans into place, but don't, again, this isn't something you really want to push and test yourself on. You want to encourage, you want to use a routine, good sleep patterns, exercise, and nutrition. You're going to hear this over and over and over again. Pacing doesn't mean avoiding all activity. It means planning out activities. 
if you're stuck in rest where you're not doing anything, you need to get out of it because you can't live life that way. But you have to do it gradually. And that's what some of the pacing is about, is returning to it gradually. Small chunks with breaks built in. This takes time to figure it out. You want to figure out the best balance for you. What works for someone else doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you. So you're going to meet people who have concussions and brain injuries, and they're going to tell you what they did, and this is the times that they did it. Good ideas, listen to that. The times may not be the same for you. Don't measure yourself against others in that way. With a brain injury, everybody is different anyway in their recovery from any sort of illness and injury, but especially in brain injury. It is your journey. Lots of things we can suggest, great strategies you can use. You need to make them work for you in your own way, though. These are just some graphs that we use here at Parkwood. Our physios put them together for physical activity. They actually work quite well for any activity. This is where people usually are when we meet them. The danger zone is the symptom zone. It's not going to happen. Nothing's going to explode or anything. Not dangerous. It's just you want to stay away from it. This is where your symptoms are going to increase. So you can see in these, in these um, graphs, People push, they're going, they keep doing the activity, they keep doing it, they keep doing it until they absolutely can't do it anymore and then they crash and they take a long time to recover and then they do it again because they're feeling pretty good and you push through and you push through and then they crash. And this pattern keeps up because this is, it's not working for them but they don't necessarily know what to do. When they meet us, when you have the chance to get to meet one of the, the team members or you're out there on your own, um, and you need uh, something to work on and something to work towards, this is where you want to go. This is where you want to start. You want to do an activity for a set period of time. Take the break before the symptoms happen. You can see in the second graph, the purple line never gets into that danger zone. So the first few times you might have to test, but do I stay on the treadmill for three minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes? So you go until you feel a few symptoms, you stop and you back it off by two or three minutes. Okay, paying bills. I'm going to try it for 10 minutes. At five, I feel crappy. All right, that's where I'm going to stop. It's going to take me longer to do it, but this is how you gradually increase it. And you want to move towards your longer term goal of being able to do something for longer. You can see here the symptom zone, the danger zone has shrunk. They're not going to happen as much. You have to go further. You have to do more activity to get even close to it. So you want to be able to do an activity for longer periods of time at higher intensity. Still, you can see in there, there's still time for rest. And at that top, in order not to get into the symptoms, that's where the rest occurs, you recover, and you start again. This is our last slide for tonight. These are just some ideas of some devices and different aids that you can use. Um, smartphones, cell phones, they're great. If you like them, if technology is your thing, they can be used for timers and alarms. Um, to limit your activity time because the timer if you set a timer especially on, on my iphone and a lot of smartphones the timer goes off and you hit snooze don't shut it off that's the problem hit snooze it keeps going off it'll go off infinitely every 10 minutes i've tried it um, so you want to do that so you automatically you hear that and you stop and you can set the timer again for your break time so you take a long enough break 10 or 15 minutes then go back to your activity or a different activity. So use that timer setting and the alarms for that. Calendars and day planners are also something that um, we use a lot that are very good to help you plan out your time. You sit and you look at the full week and you think, these are things I have to do. I plug them in and make sure that I'm doing kind of one thing each day. If something else comes up or I have a doctor's appointment, you fit that in. It doesn't work in the whole day. You move something that can be moved. So that's a little bit of prioritizing too. And Becky will talk a little bit more about that. Along with the last point on here, the pacing points system um, that Becky put together and works really well for a lot of our clients, where you assign a certain number of points um, based on the energy that it takes and the time that you spend doing it. And you're only given so many points per day. It's kind of like the Weight Watchers diet program. That's where the idea came from. And it works very well because it's something that is very um, black and white, it's concrete, it's easy to refer to, it's easy to use, 
Um, and people really like it. It's, it's a bit of a competition with yourself sort of thing. Actually, you have to be a little bit careful sometimes with people, but it works really well with, for a lot of people. Um, whiteboards, very good sometimes family members. Um, this is something that you can do. Put a small whiteboard up um, and reminders of to-do tasks or helping prioritize. This is what needs to be done today, a to-do list. Um, limiting what you put on the to-do list. Don't make it 10 things and say, oh, if you get five done today, or if you only get two done today, then there's some disappointment if you don't get that finished. So be realistic about what, if you're setting your own to-do list, or if you're a family member, a caregiver, setting a to-do list, make sure there's realistic expectations so that there's not that disappointment that, oh, I didn't get it all done today. Honestly, nobody's gonna get 10 things done in the day. They're just not. Um, so that's where we're gonna stop for today. Um, if there's any questions, we'll take those now. Um, I think I'm going to turn the webcam on, you think, for their questions. Can I see them from here? Okay. I'm just checking with Omar. Omar's my moderator, so I just need to give me a minute here. I'm going to turn the webcam on. And you guys will actually probably be able to see some of the questions. Are there any questions here from Parkwood to start off with? Go ahead. Or is it more a matter of um, something that needs to be overcome? So the question is, is pain functional or dysfunctional? Headaches, kind of use that as an example. It's a good question. I don't know all of the answers to it. Um, it's certainly something that Dr. McKenzie can look at. Um, when she's here, if you ask that question. There are a couple of things about it. It can be both of those things. So you had asked, is it, a, is it functional in that when your head starts to hurt, is it a signal to stop what I'm doing? Yes, especially in the early stages. It is a symptom, right? It's not necessarily something you want to push through. The headache will likely escalate, okay? And then you have to recover from that. There does come a point where it might become more of a chronic issue, and that's something that needs to be discussed with a doctor, okay? Because there are times, and we do have uh, clients that we've worked with who do are put on different medications to try to help and control headaches, but it depends on what they feel the source of the headache is. There's all kinds of things that it could be. Um, there can be, it can be muscular, so it could be a tension type headache, People who have never had migraine type headaches before develop them after brain injury. So that might be more of a, a vascular issue. Um, so there are times certainly where doctors feel it is appropriate to use medication. So certainly something to follow up with your physician with. Because yes, but at first it really is a signal. This is a time to slow down or, or stop. Yeah. Does that answer your question okay-ish? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I can go today and I'm going to buy a Yeah. Right. So I'm just going to repeat that so people can say this. So there's a gentleman here at Parkwood that said it's more, it's a functional for you. It's a signal, right? That you've done too much. So you can go feel great one day, go 100 miles an hour the whole day, wake up the next day and have the headache. So you are that very first graph, <laughs> right? Where, and this happens a lot. This happens for all of us. If you're feeling good, you push through, right? And, and you keep going because you're feeling good. And then the next day or the next day, you have symptoms. So in that case, the headache is the symptom. So there's different ways to look at that. Changing your activity pattern to try to limit that from happening. If the headaches persist, that would then be something to follow up with the physician about. Yeah, that's, hang on just one second. Um, 
I can't see all of these, Omer. Okay, just so everybody knows, this might cut out for the people out there at eight. Um, if we don't get to your questions that have been sent in, we will try to get to them within the next couple of days. We are, have the ability to email them out, uh, email answers out. So someone here had asked about having a stroke um, seven months ago and a difficult time, uh, major problem with recognizing faces and people um, that she should know. There is a term for it. I'm not, I don't want to say it because I'm not sure if it's correct. Um, I'll try to come back with it next week. But this is something that happens where people see faces but they don't recognize them. Or when they look at a person, they actually don't see all the details of your face. So it's very hard to figure out who that person is. Uh, I want to say it's called anastagnosia, but I'm not sure that that's right. So I'll try to come up with it next week. What to do about it? A lot of times it's a compensatory strategy. You have to, it's, it's, as opposed to trying to fix it and do therapy for it, it's a matter of often having to have a list, a piece of paper with pictures with the person's name so you can match it up. The hope would be that over time, as you do this more and more often, that you might begin to recognize the person's face and put the name with it. There are other tricks to trying to remember someone's name, matching something um, about their body if you can't recognize their face, that kind of goes with their name and connect the two. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers that question. Um, how do we know if it's... Okay, so there's a question here. Um, suggested earlier that patients with MTBI concussion should keep their family doctor informed. Should I go back to my family doctor given that my concussion was sustained a month ago and I have not seen much improvement in my symptoms for the past two weeks? When I saw him one week in um, at the recommendation of the doctor on day one at the hospital, despite significant symptoms, he asked me why I was there and told me to go home and rest more. I felt foolish for making the appointment. I understand that questions will be addressed at the end. Okay. So what this it is a good idea to go back to your family doctor. And what we try to do um, in working with our clients, by working with our clients, is to hopefully help inform family doctors more about concussion. Um, it is important to go back and see them to say that, you know, this hasn't changed. It may not change their approach, but you can ask for a referral to a program in your area, um, to another doctor in your area if you feel that it needs to happen. Um, depending, right now, we're, I know we're talking to some people um, throughout the province. So there are other programs like programs here at Parkwood, depending on where you are. It's a program like ours in Sudbury, Kingston, Ottawa, Toronto, um, further north. So that, that might be what you need to do is, is look for something like that where you can get some more information. But certainly keep the family doctor informed around um, symptoms not resolving. It has been a month. So the other thing about concussions is there is a recovery period between 6 to 9 to 12 weeks where people in the general population, it's about 85% of people, I think the number is right now, recover relatively well from their symptoms. At the end of that three-month period, they're not having a lot of symptoms. Um, once it gets beyond that, you want to look into it a little bit further. It's when it starts to become what can be diagnosed or talked about as post-concussive syndrome. So where the symptoms aren't really resolving any further after three months, you're still having significant difficulties with concentration or sleep or headaches or dizziness, light sensitivity, depending on what it is. So to that person who asked that question, yes, you're a month in, you haven't noticed much of a difference in two weeks. Rest is okay at that point, but even at a month in, you want to start a bit of a gradual return to activity. Too much rest makes it difficult to get out of rest. Um, and rest is good at the very beginning, but it's not something you want to continue with because it's not functional in your day-to-day -day life. So yes, following up with the family physician, I would recommend that. And then um, if there are some other options for you to pursue, taking a look around what services are offered in your area.
So the sleep study, how is the sleep study performed and how manageable are the sleep apnea machines? Well, I'm going to tell you a bit about the sleep studies. They're usually done, doctor makes a referral. They're done at a sleep clinic in London. They're usually here at the hospital. Um, they're uh, different places, different cities. They're in different locations. Hospital, they're sometimes private clinics. You go in and you spend a night trying to sleep all wired up. So um, the good thing is, I mean, you don't have to sleep the entire night for them to get a reading on what's going on. Um, but they, you only do that the once, and then you'll have a follow-up with either um, with a respirologist, with a doctor who specializes in that area, and then they will make recommendations about whether medication might help. Um, a lot of times, depending on build, sometimes people are asked to lose weight. Um, a CPAP machine might be, or something along those lines might be suggested. Um, I don't know how manageable the CPAP machines are. I really don't. I don't have any personal experience with them. I do have clients that use them and use them quite well, and I know they report an improvement in their sleep um, and therefore an overall improvement kind of in how they're feeling. I'm going to get some clarification on that one. So this last question, and then we'll kind of wrap it up for the night. Um, and then I'll get back to some of the other ones. I'll send out some emails. Um, asking about um, being easily irritated by sounds, is that common with brain injury? So yes, absolutely it is. It's that noise sensitivity that we talked about earlier. Even the quietest, what, you, what we think of as the quietest environment, someone with a brain injury can hear things like the fan on the projector, and it can be distracting. Um, being irritated by it, that's part of that fatigue and the difficulty controlling your emotions. Yes, you are more irritable because you have a brain injury. It's again because the brain is not working as efficiently as it was before. It can't cope as well. It's trying to do so much to help you feel better and figure out where you are in space and what am I going to do next and what am I trying to say and what's going to happen tomorrow and trying to decide what's for dinner. It's doing all of that and it's not great at any one of those things. So you are more irritable. You're more tired. And like I said before, your emotions are sitting at a much higher level than they would have before. Um, so yes, it, it is, and it's not, it's not just noise that irritates people more quickly after brain injury. You are more irritable afterwards, after the injury. So I think we'll wrap up for tonight. Um, if anybody has any other questions, we'll be here for a few minutes. And hopefully we'll see everybody out um, next week for our second half. And my colleague Joe will be here speaking with me as well. So I would just everybody like have to a good night. Thanks for coming. thank Kelly for a great presentation. That was a lot of useful information. Remind everybody that this uh, webinar will be archived. And you can find it on the St. Joe's website. Information about accessing that will come up. But we'll get this up as quickly as we can. So thank you, Kelly.